I can't imagine the type of world that you want to live in that if we don't take action now when we're adults, what is the world going to be like? Us young people are going to be the leaders of the future and with that responsibility comes the duty to stand up. Perhaps the loudest voice in the fight against climate change is the least represented in government and business. The voice of the youth. The youth, we're smart, we're educated, we're informed, we're passionate, and we have something to say about this. And if you're not going to do anything about it, then we are. The youth climate movement is arguably the most visible activist project in the world today. We are realizing the problems that we are facing are being faced by people in different corners of the world and meeting youth from around the world gives you a different perspective as to solutions for your own region. In this episode of Bloomberg Green, we meet some of these activists, learn about their concerns and the changes they're fighting for. People better watch out for youth in this next year because we are becoming more and more restless. After a two-week crossing of the Atlantic by boat, Greta Thunberg, the world's most famous youth climate activist, landed in New York to attend the UN Climate Action Summit. The speech she delivered there will become her most famous. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? If you didn't know about the youth climate movement before that speech, you certainly did after. Bloomberg News' Akshat Rati got to know some of these youth climate activists through a book he edited with contributions from 60 voices around the world. But the pandemic keeping students at home, we asked Akshat if the movement was still relevant. It's a good question, and we've seen when the movement was at its peak in, in 2019, they were all over the front pages of newspapers and publications around the world. And of course, the pandemic made uh, that go away. But we are starting to see the movement stick to their principles because their main argument is that science says we should be cutting emissions really quickly, and we are still not doing that. And we can see their revival already in March, for example, some came out on the streets in countries where they were permitted to. And I feel like when the pandemic goes away, we'll see the full force come back. Another climate activist to come out of the student strikes, Fridays for Future, was Alexandria Villasenor. She also represented the youth at the DNC. I caught up with Alexandria and spoke about how she got involved and what comes next. On a trip back to where I was born and raised in Northern California, in November of 2018, I was here when one of the worst wildfires in California's history broke out, the Paradise Fire. I actually have asthma and the smoke was seeping into my home and making me really sick. And at that point, I was super upset, of course, because California is on fire all year round now. Even just in this past year, we've had our first gigafire. And so I decided to take my first form of activism in the form of school strike in solidarity with the Fridays for Future movement. And so on December 14th of 2018, I took all of the climate anxiety and eco grief I was feeling and I turned it into action by going and striking every Friday at the United Nations headquarters. And I did that all the way up until the beginning of the pandemic, so over a year. And you also have your own organization, correct? So what's the goal? I found that when young people talk to another young person, we speak the same language and we have the same culture in Generation Z. And so it empower, empowers us in different ways. And so the mission of Earth Uprising is to educate each other peer to peer on the climate crisis. And through that, empower each other to go out and take direct action. Please, all of you here tonight, join me in welcoming these brave young heroes to the stage. And you work with other very well-known prominent climate activists. Do you guys decide together about what you want to pressure world leaders or the UN about? She's gonna go in the UN. The youth climate movement is this ecosystem of youth organizations. There's youth working in different areas, some direct action, some education, some focusing on the systems of oppression. And so we come after the system for climate action from all different areas and all are really needed. We have to be able to make money off of 
When you organize for political leaders, what do you want to hold them accountable for, the ones that were just recently elected when it comes to climate? What's the number one goal you think they should be focusing on? I think what I'd like to say to world leaders and business leaders is to remind them that they have a moral responsibility to help preserve the planet and all of its natural wonders for future generations. I'd also like to say that this is not how most of the world's business leaders are acting right now. My generation sees how the planet continues to be exploited for profit. We need the business leaders of the world to step up and invest in renewable energy. In late 2019, I attended COP25 in Madrid. And then a month later, I attended the World Economic Forum in Davos. And what I noticed by attending both of these events is that more progress towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions and more bold climate agendas were actually put forward at the World Economic Forum than they were at COP25. And so I know businesses have the power to make a difference because I really did see it firsthand. Coming up, defending paradise in the Seychelles, protecting the rainforest in Brazil, and a nine-year-old taking on the Indian government. Their story's next. This is Bloomberg Green. The Seychelles is a small island developing state made up of 115 islands just off the coast of East Africa. So we're literally a dot. I primarily see myself as a conservationist working with the Seychelles Islands Foundation, which manages the, and protects the two UNESCO sites for Seychelles, the uh, Aldabra Atoll and the Valley de May. We may be small in land mass, but our ocean territory is 1.4 square million kilometers. So 98% of our territory is ocean. We've protected just under 50% of our land mass and we're protecting 30% of our ocean. So we're 10 years ahead of the global target of 30 by 30. For our size, we're punching above our weight. Aldabra is an amazing protected area, but you have limits on how much you can protect it. And whether it's climate change or it's plastic pollution, it's showing that, yeah, you can be a million miles away and you can still have an impact on this place. There's no plastic pollution denier, like there's a climate change denier. But it almost begins to start a larger conversation about the Anthropocene. A part of this project that was involved with remove 25 metric tons of plastic pollution, we realized that 80% in terms of weight of what we're picking up was fishing gear, ghost gear. And then you can start connecting to that to the fact that Seychelles is the second largest driver in the economy is uh, industrial fishing. Unsustainable fisheries is an ever-present issue connected to pollution, plastic pollution. How we basically move to be sustainable and equitable, and I think it's important to emphasize equitable because it must not just be a race to, to extract, it must be a cultivated approach. Deep sea bed mining is something that for me, very few people have heard of, but the, the proponents are saying this would be the way in which we supply the world with the precious metals needed for the renewable energy revolution. Deep sea bed mining takes place at below 250 meters, but we know what happens already at the terrestrial level, be it child labor, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, will only be likely to be worse Talking to some of the experts, they think the sediment that would be lifted up could be in suspension for, for years, if not decades. You know, in terms of coral, in terms of other species being affected, that's gone. And we didn't even know it existed in some cases. So I'm a proponent of a 10-year moratorium that would be in line with the UN Decade for Ocean Science, so we understand a bit more about the ocean before we go to places we've never been. The role of the ocean in terms of carbon sequestration, provision of, of food, it's a scary thing when you're on the same side as industrial fishers. The true thing I think we should be looking towards is the circuit economy. If we dealt with our e-waste the way we should, we wouldn't be needing to go elsewhere. Protecting and sustainably managing the ocean is essential for food, livelihoods, and mitigating climate disruption and related disasters. What we're finding, especially from the Global South perspective, is a lot of commitments are hollow. Something like plastic pollution, climate change, the issue is political will, it's not technological, it's commitments. To live in an island that's so protected and also fragile at the same time is rare and, and I'm privileged. My name is João Henrique, I'm Brazilian, I'm based in Curitiba and I work as a climate activist. I've been to Amazon once in my life, 
working in a place called Tapajós. I live in the area of Mata Atlântica. It's the biome with the most uh, impact so far because it was the first one colonized. I think all the struggles are connected because the, the main source of the violence is the same, which is the agriculture, the livestock and soy plantations, big monocultures, but also mining in the Amazon. The leadership of those environmental groups is changing because 10 years ago, they were all mostly white people from the middle class. And right now we are getting more attention and more importance to the indigenous communities and traditional communities in Brazil being the leadership of environmental groups with a more focus on social environmental justice. In Brazil, the traditional community lands are the ones who have the lowest rates of deforestation. And most of the, this land doesn't have a legal protection. Not only the, the conservation is not secured, but the communities are not secured as well. And since they are in this gray space, the loggers, the mining, the, the farmers are using violence against the traditional communities. To give ownership, legal ownership to the communities would be a really just way to make a historical reparation with those communities and also to help lower our emissions. We can't talk about environmental justice if we don't tackle the inequalities. And the favelas are places that highlights how inequal our country is. We have this shift between the leaders of the environmental groups. It's the same thing with the favelas. People are getting engaged with the environmental movement. We had elections last year. We worked on building an online free course on climate change and cities for candidates. They needed to commit to the climate agenda and with civic participation to be able to access the course. We publicized a list of candidates who took the course so also the voters could see, okay, my candidate is committed to the climate agenda, so I'm gonna vote for him. We could elect 21 candidates, which are now public leaders who are committed to the climate agenda in 18 different cities. I've been working almost for 10 years on activism. The first approach that I had was with the cyclist movement. Every day a cyclist gets killed in Brazilian cities. The cyclists are considered enemies of the, the drivers. And also this highlights the, the inequality because here in Brazil, uh, the people who use public transport are the ones who can't afford a car. The current federal government considers civil society and environmental groups as enemies of the state. There's not a, a beautiful way to say that. We won't have agriculture in 20 years if we keep on this same approach. So we need to show that there's other kinds of economy who are strong with the forests up and not down. People always tell me that you are too young to get involved in such activism. But I prove them that age doesn't matter to make a difference. I am big or small, it doesn't matter. I am a girl child. I'm strong, smart, intelligent and brave. What do we want? What do we want? I came to Delhi in 2016 for the first time. But my life became very messy due to the high air pollution. Later, I moved to Bhubaneswar, Odisha for my schooling. And again, my home in Odisha was set by Cyclone Deadly in 2018 and Cyclone Fani in 2019. All such incidents in my young life turned me into a child climate activist. I have three main demands to our leaders and the government to change the system. First is to pass this climate change law as soon as possible from the paper to gum action. If they pass this climate change law, then we can control the carbon emission and greenhouse gases. It will also give the climate justice to the poor vulnerable people who are already the victims of climate change. Second is to include climate change as a compulsory subject in our school education curriculum. Then we can fight the climate change from the grassroots and it will also help to teach our world leaders by their own children and grandchildren. 
Number third is in India there are 350 million stents. At 350 million stents plant million ten trees every year, then we will plant over 3.5 billion trees. In October 2020, President of India enacted a new law to fight the Delhi air pollution crisis permanently. And this is our great achievement. The states of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Sikkim and Bihar has taken the initiative to include climate change as a compulsory subject in our school education curriculum. India has become the second country in the world after Italy taking such initiative in the history of the world. The best gift parents can give to their children is not beautiful house, expensive cars, not some money. The best gift you can give to your children is a beautiful planet. To give this planet, you have to change yourself. If you can change yourself, then you can change your family. If you can change your family, then you can change your neighborhood. If you can change your neighborhood, then you can change your community. If you can change community, then you can change state. If you can change state, then you can change country. If you can change a country, then you can change the whole world. Change means empowerment. Empowerment means independent. Independent means freedom. Freedom is when you can protect your land and environment. Freedom is when no one can discriminate you on the basis of caste, creed, color, sex, or any other differences. Freedom is when you can read and write. Freedom is when you are out of hunger. Freedom is when we are all together in this fight. Fight for your freedom. What do we want? Climate justice! What do we want it? Now! What do we want? Climate justice! What do we want it? Now! I got involved in climate activism from a young age. I grew up in the most forested region in Kenya. This love for nature also made me want to learn and understand more about the environment. Just getting to discover that the wild forests were being destroyed and being burned down at alarming rates. Discovering that there were children in some parts of the world where they had to put on pollution masks just to go to school. That's when I realized that there was more to nature and the environment around the world beyond what I was seeing close to my home. And of course this made me feel angry but it also gave me a hunger to want to do something about these challenges. Jumbo. How are you, Ni? What's up, people? I still recall planting my first tree at the age of seven, and I've also been able to found an organization that's called Green Generation Initiative that I founded back in 2016. This initiative focuses on a campaign that I dubbed Adopt a Tree Campaign to make sure that every child in every school gets a chance to plant and adopt a tree in their school compound. Unless we explain to the children in deep terms, then they will not understand what the climate crisis means for them. We also expose them to understand that they can be a part of the solutions. And of course, this was to make them develop a love for nature and at the same time help in contributing to the country's forest cover increment that is supposed to hit and surpass a 10% forest cover by the year 2022. Right now, my country stands at about 7.3% and this is below the UN required minimum for every country. I see a lot of trees being planted all around the world, but the big question remains how many of these trees get to grow up to maturity? It is so great to see so many countries committing to net zero, but we want to see what they are doing right now to be able to get to this trajectory that we are talking about. As much as we're focusing on emissions reduction, we should also make sure that our ecosystems are also remaining intact and being well managed because we are both in a climate crisis and an ecological crisis. And unless we recognize that the two crises are happening at the same time, then it's going to be difficult for us to address them as they should be addressed. The world is changing rapidly and every consequence of inaction of the world leaders, we are the ones who have to live longer with it. Coming up, we explore the different theories of change behind climate groups. This is Bloomberg Green. There's a new force of nature at hand stirring all over the world. They are the young people whom, frankly, we have failed, who are angry, who are organized, who are capable of making a difference. They are a moral army. 
the Biden-Harris administration has an opportunity to deliver for a generation of progressives that will probably represent the Democratic Party in about 20 to 30 years. We love to say, you know, young people, they're not the future, they're our present. They campaigned on climate, they advertised on climate, they talked about climate in every single presidential and vice presidential debate. True, and here's He's the talking deal. about the hey. Green New Deal. And there's no doubt that was an absolutely critical element of getting a record number of young people to turn out and vote. I think that this is a generation of the Green New Deal. It's a generation that is calling for taking fossil fuel money out of politics. Young people are changing the views of their parents. I don't think young people are gonna fix this for us, nor should they, and they've been very clear that it is not their job. But the question is, can they catalyze a movement that embodies the kind of urgency that we need in the face of this crisis? Every single person up here represents the power of the movement. It represents the power of indigenous communities, the power of young people organizing, the power of the movement for black lives organizing, showing that climate is intersectional with every one of our needs and demands. We have more young people pushing for change. We have more proof that what is good for the climate is good for business and is good for us all. Climate action is our mission. Welcome back to Bloomberg Green. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern in London. We've gone around the world speaking to activists, mostly virtually, of course, and learning about what they are doing to enact change. Whether it's big business or big government, they want their voices heard. But what have they achieved so far? Bloomberg's Akshat Rati says it's a difficult question to answer. With any protest, it's very hard to connect one action to one outcome. But maybe there are three ways to look at it, and they're tied to the three different youth movements that exist. The first one is Extinction Rebellion. Their MO is to be disruptive and to gain attention to their message, which is to act on the climate emergency and act with urgency. The second group is the Sunrise Movement in the US, which has helped elect green-minded politicians like AOC and then re-elect them and really put the Green New Deal on the political agenda of President Joe Biden. And then there is the Fridays for Future movement. And that movement is much more subtle. They're just saying, look, scientists have been talking about climate action for a very long time, and they've told you exactly what you need to be doing leaders, both governments and corporations, why aren't you doing it? How are the C-suite, how are chief executives around the world thinking of the youth movement? Do they need to care? We know that one of the power of the youth movement is that these are kids who have parents who are in powerful positions around the world. So last year, for example, when we spoke to the CEO of Shell, he told us that his 10-year-old daughter came back home one day and asked him point blank, is Shell a part of the problem? Those things affect people much more closely and makes them realize why this problem is so big. Right, and if they're the youth now, how is the fossil fuel industry going to be attracting talent if the youth movement today refuses to work in, say, oil and gas companies? We are already starting to see oil and gas companies and fossil fuel companies in general trying to rebrand themselves. So a number of oil companies have lost the word oil in them. So Stat Oil most recently became Equinor, for example. As a reporter, I've uh, talked to CEOs of oil companies who've said, we're not an oil company, we are an energy company. And that's all okay, but if 95% of uh, your business is tied to fossil fuels, it's going to be a hard job to convince uh, young people to join your company. That does it for this week's edition, but keep the conversation going. Follow us on Twitter at Climate. I'm Anne-Marie Hordern, and this is Bloomberg Green.